All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, yet another Arctic Observing Summit session. I'm glad you all could join us today. Uh, looks like we have 14 people on right now. I imagine that number will continue to climb as we get uh, into the session. Um, but could we start with the uh, standard chat monitor introduction, please? Hi, everyone. I'm Olivia. I'm the chat monitor today. I think most of you have already um, been on several sessions, but for those who are new, I'm going to paste in the chat box our code of conduct. Um, we, we do ask that you are familiar with it um, so we get some great respectful discussions at our session today. Um, again, a few reminders. You will start out uh, with your video off and being on mute. Please feel free to unmute yourself when you want to speak up and um, there is also a raise hand function when you hover over the participants in your name um, i will be monitoring the chat so if you prefer to put comments in the chat box i will make sure to bring that to the attention of the session back to you alice thank you um so to give a uh, quick overview of what we're planning for today uh, this session is really going to be focused around breakout discussions, uh, focusing on how we might assess what is an impactful essential Arctic variable. Um, so again, this is going back to this idea of the roads process and the Arctic Observing Summit being a forum for community, um, and, and by community, I mean kind of broader Arctic Observing community input into this process, into what it might look like and how we can move it forward. So the big topics for uh, today's session are going to be, again, how do you evaluate what is a essential variable, what is impactful or important, what does that mean in this context? How do we uh, link these variables to areas of social good um, or societal good? And then what do we need to do in order to define observing requirements from those links? Um, so again, we're going to spend the bulk of our time in the middle of the session uh, in a, in smaller group discussions, but we will start out with some open discussion first and then bring it back into the full group for, for a full uh, report out at the end. Um, I imagine many of you are familiar with these organizations and concepts by now, but I will review them just in case. Uh, SEON, or the Sustaining Arctic, Arctic Observing Networks, uh, is a joint initiative of the Arctic Council and the International Arctic Science Committee. Um, it is established to coordinate um, and facilitate connections between producers and end users of Arctic observations. The Arctic Observing Summit, this meeting, um, and the broader process surrounding it is a uh, ongoing process uh, that is a task under SEON, it's activity of SEON, um, that serves as a forum for community engagement into this process and uh, the kind of bottom up side of organizing and coordinating Arctic, obs Arctic observations. Um, SEON is developing uh, the roadmap for Arctic observing and data systems to clarify roads has nothing to do with actual drive on them roads. Um, and the idea here is that uh, this strategy for implementing a grander, um, more integrated Arctic observing system uh, is being built collaboratively through, in part, uh, this feedback from the Arctic Observing Summit. So today's goals really are going to be in uh, providing that input into the roads process. Um, there are many ways of looking at this problem. Uh, what we're going to be doing today uh, is breaking this into two pieces. First, how do we identify what uh, should be an essential Arctic variable uh, we can discuss whether or not we should actually call them essential Arctic variables or something else. Um, but then the second piece of this is for a given societal benefit area for some sort of research question, what sort of applications and what sort of requirements are there for the observations that would come out of that. Um, so we'll be discussing these ideas in smaller group breakout sessions uh, starting in a little while. Um, uh, but to reiterate, um, essential Arctic variables are, uh, I'm going to emphasize this, a conceptually broad phenomena, uh, which is to say that uh, we don't have a clear definition of an essential Arctic variable. And that's something that we are trying to accomplish on these calls is to gather input as to what this idea should mean. 
Um, so we will say that they are identified. Um, essential Arctic variables are identified by uh, them being critical to achieve, achieving some sort of Arctic relevant social benefit. They're they are defined um, by requirements for the observing system that's measuring them, and then they are implemented through specific recommendation uh, based on available technology and practices. So we're not trying to invent new things at this stage. Um, within this broad description, uh, essential Arctic variables are still a concept that is up for debate and discussion, and that's, that's what we're doing. Um, so uh, to get at the things that the Rhodes process and SEON has asked of this working group, um, we spent yesterday uh, dealing with part two. This is a, a schema for a structured collaboration and coordination model. Um, today, we're really focusing on this part one and, and thinking about how we might go about assessing impactful Arctic variables. We have a number of models or examples to work with. Uh, and these, uh, this is one such mapping of, of these details. Um, we have comparable examples. I think we saw a number of them yesterday, uh, looking at different organizations that have been using um, similar concepts to essential variables in various senses. And the idea really being that there's, there's a direct information mapping between variables that might be measured, uh, observing networks, observing systems that are actually measuring them, and then the societal benefits and applications that this information goes into. Um, I do wanna just, since we are an afternoon session, um, do a very brief recap of what happened in this morning session and, and in previous sessions. Um, so we identified, um, or there was, a, there was a lot of input that other observing systems organize things um, organize observations reasonably well within individual disciplines and sectors. Um, again, the roads process should be complementary to these, not replacing or trying to reinvent them. Um, and related to that, the strength of an Arctic observing system out of this would be in supporting cross-sector and cross-disciplinary information sharing. Um, so there's some talk about the idea that maybe an essential Arctic variable is actually a shared Arctic variable, uh, where what uh, the criteria that makes something essential is that there are multiple communities or multiple uh, sectors that value the information that comes out of it. Um, and then ultimately that the, the ultimate structure should include uh, measurement standards, best practices, and recommendations for information pairing, uh, whether that be sets of complementary ob observations or observations that should be co-located or uh, bundles of measurements. Um, and so with that extremely brief, uh, overview, I want to open up for a discussion. Um, and our, our two big questions today, again, are how do you evaluate the most important variables uh, for, in, in this context, for an integrated Arctic observing system? Um, and then how do you link these to areas of social or societal good? Does anybody have any thoughts on those? And you're welcome to either raise your hand, type something into the chat box, or just unmute yourself and, and talk. Hi, this is Bill Manley. Um, so yeah, these are very good questions. And so um, I think in this kind of context, it can help to uh, start with user needs, have it be stakeholder needs driven rather than, um, you know, say technology or data driven. In, the, in that one slide, you had a feedback uh, about the whole long process. Is that one is great? It's very helpful. Anyone have thoughts on on those? I absolutely agree that that user needs and and the benefit areas and applications should be driving this process. Um, any thoughts on? how or who those, uh, those benefits might need to be planning for.
Sandy, would you like to say anything to motivate this discussion further? Oh, I was just typing something into the chat. Um, the, so we've done a couple pilot examples of these through uh, of, of kind of value tree work. Um, for me, I have often found that the easiest starting point is in the value tree space. And it's often difficult to start by looking or conceiving of what the essential variables could be or, or should be. Um, but, but I think people do have a lot of experience and exposure to things like applications, like forecasts, assessments, um, more of those kind of decision support tools that are a little bit more concrete and tangible um, that we know that you have to kind of build user services around. And so um, in, instead, instead of being in that kind of abstract space of either benefit areas or um, uh, variables, uh, sometimes applications can be grounding. Um, Catherine, it looks like you had some, some thoughts about uh, potentially really good applications. Do you wanna expand on that a little bit? Uh, yes, good morning. Um, my thought was just that uh, if this is all supposed to be about societal benefits, then consultation with our community members uh, will be extremely important. And the two things I, I typed in there are just things that have come up in multiple discussions, like uh, food security, which of course is another working group. Uh, but then also uh, the impact of uh, landform changes such as erosion. I was just thinking of uh, Tuck Tiak Tuck up in the Canadian North where uh, local people are very concerned about their their town actually eroding into the Arctic Ocean. Great, thank you. Um, does anybody have any other thoughts on the the topic of applications um, and how that might feed into what makes uh, what could make something an art essential Arctic variable? Hi, this is uh, Gabrielle Gascon. I was participating mainly in working group number two yesterday, so hi everyone. Um, one application, I don't know if it was mentioned in uh, some of the previous um, discussions that you had, were for more um, emergency management and search and rescue. Um, my line of work is more about hazardous weather uh, and how we can provide information, especially the North. I work in Canada. Uh, with she have low population, but it's um, it's low risk, high consequences when you're talking about the weather and how um, a series of hazardous weather that could come in uh, would impact transportation, emergency response, or search and rescue. Um, and so, for us, one of an um, essential variable would be hazardous weather. How do we observe for that to then provide services for emergency management? So just to pull that apart a little bit, Gabrielle, is, is hazardous weather itself an essential variable or is hazardous weather uh, uh, a kind of collection of uh, phenomena for which you need certain kinds of forecasts and those are underpinned by things that are, are maybe in more kind of bite-sized parcels. I, I know in your applications group yesterday, you were talking about wind as potentially um, being a, a variable that um, hazardous weather forecasts really needed to get a better handle on. Is that, does that resonate? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a very good point. Thank you very much for articulating uh, this um, a bit more clearly, I guess, than I have done it. Um, but yeah, I guess the hazardous weather would be uh, the beginning of the big uh, umbrella where for us, the, um, some of the hazardous weather are blizzards, uh, of fog um, and high wind events because they do affect transport. And then from there, you, yeah, we identified variables of interest. 
I think the avalanche stud is also includes into this category, I guess. To get at uh, coming back to what you were just saying about the various variables that would go into hazardous weather, it sounds like those uh, are particularly useful when they are uh, kind of bundled into a set of observations or a set of variables. Is that this is that sense correct? Yeah, be, well, yeah, because you 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 need more than one. But also, if we go for taking the example of wind, uh, some of the discussions that we had yesterday in the other working group was about air pollution. Um, so wind can play a role for hazardous weather, but also for air pollution when we're talking about distribution um, or plumes of um, of pollution. So so yeah, it would be more into an observing system. Um, for the weather, how we get, um, how we would design an observing system that would provide us with the variables um, that we would need to then um, uh, to support informed decision making with respect to hazardous weather. The example you just gave about the, the relation to pollution was a really good one um, and paralleled a lot of what we were discussing this morning. Um, which was that we will frequently see a handful of different types of observations being necessary for one area, um, but that at the same time, you need some of those overlapping observations for an additional area. Um, and so, so this is somewhere where kind of consolidating or formalizing these bundles might be helpful. Uh, Martine, you had your hand up. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I also think so. If you still want to focus or continue the, the, the discussion you were just holding, and then I can wait for a second. I just and some new things. Um, I think you can probably just go ahead. Okay. Um, so things that came into my mind were uh, protection of relevant areas, like marine protected areas. Um, for culture, food security, and other reasons. And um, I think essential there is both monitoring and uh, both for monitoring marine protected areas, but also developing potential new areas that are of importance for um, those, um, uh, uh, how do you say that, um, ecological benefits. Um, and I think for there, then we need to select which keystone species are of importance uh, for those areas. So that's something, well, that maybe one of the things we can think about. And the other thing is sustainable catch for food security, um, and especially um, uh, data on catch and bycatch and standardized reporting of those uh, that information, because it's really working in, in certain areas, and especially in the Arctic Ocean. So those were the things I would like to throw in. Great. Uh, Catherine, you've got your hand up. Uh, yes, I was just going to add into uh, what Gabriel was uh, talking about earlier and uh, Shandar had brought in the idea of uh, the need to monitor for land, uh, landslides. I would say all natural disasters. So in our north, for example, there's three areas that are that have a fairly high risk of earthquakes. And the possibility, of course, with uh, tsunamis, which would be incredibly devastating uh, to many of these communities. Um, and then also in Iceland, uh, volcanic eruptions, um, the yokel hubs, the, um, uh, I've forgotten what they're called in English, the um, uh, glacial... Uh, uh, outburst floods, I think. Outburst floods, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, which is pretty bad because I am an English speaker. Uh, then... Um, what was the other one I was going to, oh, well, and then of landslides and stuff like that too. So all natural disasters and being able to better uh, monitor and also to uh, um, eventually to uh, predict, et cetera. Great. Yeah, there's a, it seems like there's a whole uh, host of application areas related to hazards. Um, and, and kind of natural disasters. Uh, does anybody else have things to add um, either on that topic or, or related application areas? Uh, 
All right. Um, then, then a related question would be: it, We have a virtually endless list of observations that would be very important to particular areas and particular applications. Um, do you see any features of some that might elevate them to a status that we need a, a broader kind of community consensus around how, where, or uh, in what manner to measure them? If we went with uh, Gabriel's weather, uh, I think that's a good start because most communities will have a weather station and there's already a fair amount of weather forecasting that's uh, in place. Uh, of course, there's lots of areas where we could improve, um, but that's an interesting one because not only are there the weather stations, but there's also uh, all sorts of radar and other imaging uh, remote sensing techniques that we can use to monitor the weather. So weather is a great a great topic to kind of dig into here. Uh, do you think there are areas, or do you think there are opportunities for an integrated Arctic observing system um, or, or collaborative Arctic observing system to be able to supplement the level of organization and data uh, kind of availability that's already there in the meteorological community? What might be interesting with weather, I, I mean, much of the weather is already uh, openly available in that you can go uh, to the weather station and you can see what the data is about, um, readily available. But it would be really interesting to connect the weather stations across the Arctic and to make that uh, compatible and uh, give people the opportunity to be able to uh, look at that data um, as a whole and possibly start uh, teaching people more about uh, weather modeling and uh, forecasting. I'd like to echo on that. That was a very good point. Um, one of the things that I've noticed with all the time that I've worked in Arctic weather is there are a lot more smaller Arctic weather stations that exist that we may not be aware of because they're not part of, let's say, a, a bigger government initiative or they're more shorter term uh, field studies. So one way, um, as was mentioned, was to try and um, have a, a, a more exhaustive database of what is uh, existing, but also looking at what uh, measurements are done at those different observing sites to see what instruments worked uh, what instruments had problems with and to try and build on what people have learned in operating instruments, measuring different variables in the north um, to see how they can um, continue to build their own observing system. So it seems like part of what this, this process and this uh, effort could ultimately lead to is some sort of uh, forum that uh, includes um, includes opportunities for observers to identify and talk to other people who are observing similar things across the Arctic. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, it looked like Olivia wanted to say something from the chat box. Yeah, just really quick from the North Slope Science Initiative. Um, they had a process for their scenarios to look at what observing monitoring requirements should be prioritized for the changing North Slope of Alaska. And, you know, one way to look at it is which observing requirements, you know, span the greatest number of environmental impacts. So potentially the greatest number of societal benefit areas could be one way to prioritize it. The other way of looking at it too is, are there some observing requirements that have just an outsized weight of its impact in informing decisions for one particular um, environmental impact. So, you know, while it'd be nice if, if everything had 
uh, equal weights. It's, it's difficult to weight some of these observing variables if you're looking at it only serving the most number of societal benefits if there are also some observing variables that maybe only serve one or two, um, but they have a very importance to those particular issues. And I'd like to build on, on what Olivia said, because I think this really speaks to the, the underlying criteria and, and how, do you, how, do you, how do you weigh where you're gonna get the most mileage and in the, in the weather discussion, I, I dropped something into the chat. So Copernicus did this study for meteorological variables in the Arctic last year. And, you know, they're kind of the usual suspects, but we also have the Europe polar prediction going on right now. We have the mosaic experiment going on right now. And some of these more kind of um, uh, process oriented or, or model based studies, I think can help lead us towards those um, variables in this list that either have the greatest impact on improved forecasting um, or the uh, or the the greatest um, impact on on other aspects of the system you know mosaic was really initially to a large degree organized around the the um, the cloud structure in the Arctic, because that was such a, a poorly understood and highly sensitive um, area. Um, observing system experiments can help us uh, become can become revealing about uh, about those sensitivities um, as well. So, within you know, those are some of the practices that are often used within. Um, the weather model development community um, to improve forecasts. I recently also heard about a Canadian um, uh, planning model that they use that's a spatial planning model for where they should be putting more weather stations knowing that it's such a sparse network and they took into account um, kind of socioeconomic factors of where people are living in the far north and where industry is centered in the far north to make sure that their enhancements to the system were going to land in the most impactful areas. So that's kind of the some of the toolbox um, things to think about. I think it would be a really interesting thought process to think about what a what an analog to mosaic or gear of polar prediction type effort at identifying observing needs, um, what that would look like in implemented for either communities or some um, private kind of private sector application. Um, unless anybody else has other thoughts uh, related to these uh, these questions, we can start moving towards the breakout discussions. Did you want to say something, Bill? Yeah, oh, yes. Well, I think this has probably already been mentioned, and, and I'm coming mainly from the data data working groups, so I'm, I'm not aware of everything that's been discussed here, but um, I think as, as many of us know, the goose process for identifying essential ocean variables um, establishes a precedent for how we can establish uh, essential Arctic variables, maybe in a different way, but um, that one web page is, is uh, you know, explanatory and, and perhaps helpful. Thanks. All right, um, so, so, Sorry, somebody's uh, okay. Uh, echo is taken care of. So the the next step is going to be moving towards a breakout discussion um, where we're going to kind of drill into more detail in identifying criteria um, by which to determine essential Arctic variables um, and to really focus on what are the most impactful uh, and how we might define that in this context. Um, 
so the the breakout discussion is split into two pieces. The first is focused on that. The second one, uh, within your discussion group, um, you will take or pick something as a uh, essential Arctic variable. Um, you're not you're not committed to this forever, uh, but for the purposes of this discussion, take pick an essential Arctic variable. Think about its applications. Think about the the research and and societal questions that might come out of that. Um, and then think about what the observing requirements are to, to match that. Um, so I'm going to see if I can open. Yes. Um, so the document uh, that I'll, I'll post to the chat box in a minute, um, again, we'll, we'll talk through this process. Um, has a set of structured questions to get at evaluating these essential Arctic variables. Um, but then I, what I do wanna talk through briefly before we split up uh, is the second part in looking at societal benefit areas and requirements capture. Um, so we're gonna ask you to, to pick a variable, in this case, we went with sea ice thickness, um, come up with some example or examples of questions, hypothesis, or community problems that you might consider. Um, and then think about what observations are or could be made uh, that address these questions. Um, and then what, what it would mean for those to be, to be meaningful. Um, so absolutely welcome to uh, fill in as much of this table as you want. You don't have to fill in everything. Uh, we've set up this discussion template as a Google Doc, so we'll send um, the link to it in the chat box in a moment. But the idea being that everyone, um, if you have things you want to add, you can just make a new copy of the document, uh, share it with us, and we'll coll collect and uh, collate all the notes that come out of this after this discussion. Um, so if I can find somewhere, I had the agendas for this. Um, there we go. Uh, so I'm going to put the link to the document um, that you'll be working out of in the um, Okay, so the document that you're working out of is in the chat box. Um, I'll go back into the slides. Um, and so how we're gonna divide up into these discussion groups is according to kind of themes of observations. It looks like we have about 18 people on the call right now. So we'll aim for uh, three, I think we'll, we'll try for three groups. Um, so if you could go ahead and in the participant list, uh, in the Zoom window, um, hover over your name uh, where it says more, uh, you can select rename um, and go ahead and add a number in front of your name that corresponds to one of these types of observations. Um, we have seven possible themes here. We're gonna have to bundle people a little bit when, uh, when putting together these discussion rooms, but just to get a sense of what types of observations people are interested in. We'll try and get some overlapping interests. So if you could take a moment to do that, um, and we'll have our, our uh, meeting moderator go ahead and start moving people into discussion rooms. And, and Ellis, just a reminder, how long do we have for this first part? Oh, uh, so we're recommending that you spend uh, roughly 20 minutes um, or, or roughly 20 minutes on each piece. Uh, we are, I'm sorry, the, the times on this slide are a little uh, are left over from this morning. Um, but uh, 20 minutes to half an hour, we'll be back in about an hour. Um, we do recommend uh, that you take a 10 minute break, um, go stretch your legs, get more coffee, whatever it is you need. 
Um, so we'll start at 15 after the hour for discussion um, and then reconvene at uh, 05 after the next Great. hour. Yep, thank you. So Alice, um, we are doing four breakout rooms. Um, so let's do let's do three breakout rooms. I think we can combine um, one and four, and then uh, do twos and everyone else's. So one and four into one room and a two yes. three. Okay. Yeah. And which one do you want to be in? Uh, leave me out for the moment. Okay. So I will put Gabriel in year either one or three. So shall I put your three okay? Okay. You have control, so you get to you get to make executive decisions on it. <laughs> okay. So I got four people in. Oops. I'm sorry. And Alice, would you mind just verbally again? There's a template. We're gonna we're just gonna choose an example EAV and work through the template. Yeah, so the the, oops, the template will will talk through everything. Um, I've just put the template into the the chat box again. Um, so you'll you'll spend the first chunk of time talking about what makes or kind of how you decide on EIV, um, and then the second chunk of time um, will be working through the example using the EIV that you pick. Thank you. I think the room assignment has been done. So we have uh, five people in room one, which is topic one to four, three people in room two, and four people in room three. Okay, perfect. Um, so, I think you can go ahead. Uh, if, if there are people who have not selected yeah, one, I think. Uh, um, Aust Aust Austin not assigned. Oh, uh, Kath, I, I think Catherine said something in the chat box and she'd like to be in oh. one. Okay, I, I didn't see that. Okay. Okay, and uh, Catherine be room one. All right. So and then could you, could you just put me in room two then? Okay. Thanks. All right. There's one people here. I guess group one, uh, share what you guys discussed during the session. Um, Anna, is that something that you could do since you you're, you you have the document as well from that? Uh, yes, sure, I will try. Uh, so we had a group that combined automatic incident observation, sensing, and ship vessels and buoys. So actually, before we started going through um, the template, we sort of started to thinking about the variables uh, to identify the areas of expertise. Uh, and we decided to focus on permafrost after um, some level of discussion. But in terms of more broadly, what uh, does a sensible variable mean to us and how we define them? 
we were talking about um, things uh, like statistical modeling. So predictive potential of data is uh, really something that seems of crucial importance to many groups of stakeholders because we don't only need to know the current state, but also try to um, get some models and predictions. Then we were talking a lot about uh, how these variables should be useful for multiple groups of users, including local communities, and uh, in particular, indigenous elderly, and yeah, then scientific community, policymakers, businesses, and basically all the relevant groups. And at that point, we made the link to the SANE expert panels because we think that this need for structured decision making framework that assesses. Uh, the combined relevance and impact of the criteria is something that could actually be addressed within the expert panels groups. We just need to make sure that they are really representative of different, of multiple groups of data users. So yeah, I think that was kind of key criteria for us. Um, and then we uh, tried to go through this table in quite a lot of detail in relation to permafrost throw. And yeah, I can actually just quickly share the... Oh, no, I can't because you're sharing the screen. Okay, no worries. Um, going through this process, we identified that um, we went into a very high level of detail and recognized that Permafrost throw is a very broad issue that could be then brought into a lot of detail because it has a very broad um, ecosystem implications, starting from loss of infrastructure or impacts of carbon cycling and also impacting of various other things. And then, yeah, we went into details of what particular measurements could be taken to address those. And whilst we were doing that, we realized that actually we sort of lost track of the initial beneficial areas that we had in mind and realized that, yeah, this is important to keep the framework um, in mind whilst we're planning the experiment, planning the observations, otherwise um, it gets difficult to keep track of things. Um, I mean, we could go into more detail, but we could also just share the link to our table if people are interested in particular um, networks and tools to observe um, permafrost and methane. I think that's it. Thank you. I think that's excellent. And I think one of the things that's really valuable about this session is as the feedback we get on the process can go into figuring out how to, how the, how to make the process more effective. Um, so uh, how about group two? Hi everyone, this is Kelly Ulig. Um, I was in group two along with Sandy Starkweather and uh, Sean Topcock uh, and Alice Bradley joined us as well. So you guys feel free to jump in if I miss something. Um, mainly we spent the majority of our discussion focusing kind of on questions. Um, oh, I guess I should say that uh, we were looking at it from a human observing perspective. Um, and we focus mainly on <laughs> questions A through D um, and kind of trying to really nail down what it meant to be an essential Arctic variable and what are all of the things that need to be considered as we move through that. Um, let me scrim through my notes here. So something we talked about was that um, in these sorts of concepts, um, an essential Arctic variable really needs to be linked conceptually um, in context with other relationships and within the knowledge system. Um, so we talked a little bit about what makes, um, uh, I guess Sean brought up a, a book by, um, I forget the woman's name now, Sheila White Watt Culture, um, The Right to be Cold which was kind of talking about how indigenous people is really um, kind of considered a right that they, they need to be cold, they need the cold to live. Um, and that, it, you know, all of their things kind of depend on that, their transportation systems, their food security, the natural environment, um, the animals that they depend on need it, all of these sorts of things. Um, and in these rapidly changing climates, um, it's really starting to affect everything from there. So, um, 
we started kind of thinking about what these essential Arctic variables mean when you elevate them to kind of a human rights uh, level. Um, and so we kind of drilled down from cold, uh, looking at it as a coupled concept, specifically looking at like ice stability um, and ice quality, not just, um, you know, ice thickness, but it, it kind of measures back to um, what people on the ground can actually observe on whether there's a lot of ridges in the ice and that sort of thing. Um, what else did we talk about? Um, Sean also brought up how important it is to um, make sure that we take our analyses back to communities as a way of kind of um, checking in and letting them know like how we came to certain conclusions. Um, and something that we heard the other day was actually that we should strive to do data analysis in <clears throat> conjunction with communities and with community members um, and kind of fold them into the process more fully. Um, so yeah, for so I think we kind of essentially came down to for something to be an essential Arctic variable, it needs to be co-produced and perhaps community driven. Um, so Alice brought up that the um, the GCAS variables are are grouped together into these kind of <coughs> bigger contexts that lend themselves more to an indigenous um, knowledge worldview, and in that things are all kind of linked together. There's nothing that essentially stands on its own. It's all a part of a bigger whole. Mm. And I think that was a kind of it. Does anyone else from our group have anything they want to contribute? No, you did a good job, Kelly. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kelly. How about group three? Hi, this is Gabrielle Gascon from group three. I was with Olivia Lee, Shridhar, Jawak, and Hazel Shapiro. And uh, we looked at um, remotely sent satellite and UAVs uh, observations. Um, so uh, in terms of um, what is meant for something to be an essential variable, um, we talked about what was previously mentioned about being a shared Arctic variable for users and stakeholders, but also for something that's useful um, for um, local communities, stakeholders, and scientific communities. There has to be a common interest and there has to be, that variable needs to have relevant and uh, meaningful impact for, for um, local communities, shareholders, and the, the scientific communities as well. And so then from there, we kind of segue into um, the second question on how we can evaluate the impact. Uh, and that one was a little bit more um, challenging for us to find a, a specific answer because there are feedbacks uh, between um, the various variables, the various changes in the Arctic, um, also, the impacts are variable based on the different people and the different communities, and it's difficult to weigh them and prioritize um, the variables or the impacts. And it was, we found that it was something that was universally challenging because there was no direct means for comparison. So then a suggestion that um, our group came up with was to perhaps narrow down the, the evaluation process and then target um, a, a, an assessment of the impact of a variable um, to specific groups. Um, so groups, for example, that were mentioned were uh, marine transportation, indigenous communities, local communities, um, and then um, the scientists and the researchers. And so doing uh, an impact of a specific variable to those smaller groups and then followed by an analysis of the results um, for all the different um, target groups. So comparison to see if there's a common impact to all of them. Um, and so then um, um, the information is variable, it is valuable for um, 
everyone that's involved, northerners, the science industry, stakeholders, the private sector as well. But um, one thing that came up with our discussion that um, um, there's, um, there's a value of putting a higher emphasis on indigenous communities to measure the impact of uh, essential Arctic variables for them. And the rest of the discussion um, was on, uh, we picked snow for us as our essential variable. Um, and it had um, needs in terms of safety, food security, infrastructure, ecosystem based management, um, could go, go for water levels for flood and hydropower. And then the rest was just filling out the table, which uh, we can share with the group if there's interest. Um, and then that's already been shared um, at the provide the email address. And um, finally, uh, we spent the last few minutes about the comments on the process. And we found that it was something that was very useful to move from a technical discussion to more applied and concrete examples, working with specific types of variables. And also we found that there was a benefit from having a wide range of, of background uh, of the people in our group um, that were able to bring in different points of view to the discussion. So we found that that was very beneficial. Um, anyone else um, on the group wanting to add anything to this summary? I think you did a great job, Gabrielle, thank you. Well, excellent, thank you. Um, so it, in structuring these groups the way we did, um, the hope was to uh, kind of bundle people who might have similar, uh, not the same background, but slightly similar backgrounds and some similar interests in order to get a wide range of possible input or possible solutions to this problem and recommendations. Um, so the next question and what we have uh, basically half an hour to, to think about is, um, can we agree on, or, or do we think there are any recommendations that should be made for how we link uh, societal benefit areas or, or human rights or these areas of social good and applications to essential Arctic variables and how we might propose those in the process? Um, so it looks like uh, Bill Manley, you have your hand up. Hi, so um, it was my impression that that last breakout session was really helpful and productive and um, uh, boy, uh, you know, just this one session today or uh, the charge to the last breakout group, that could be uh, the focus of a, a three-day work session or a three-day hackathon. <laughs> and, um, but nonetheless, even after that, I mean, that would be very helpful. Even after that, it might require uh, an expert panel of some sort to harmonize and uh, mainly to harmonize or integrate. Well, I, I appreciate hearing that having spent the last several weeks trying to figure out how to make this happen online. Um, the, if, if anybody has or wants to spend some extra time thinking about these problems, feel free to just make another copy of the form, um, write any thoughts or notes you have into it. We're going to be working with the, the notes that were generated in this and, and anything that comes in after the meeting to try and and build out this process further. Um, but I absolutely love the idea of doing a, a bigger workshop and, and hackathon on the on the process. Any other thoughts? But I didn't want to derail the discussion here about how actually we link SBAs to EABs, blah blah blah. Um. Alice, if yeah. I could chime in. Um, so one thing that um, the working group I was part of identified was the the importance of of um, linking specific essential variables to different societal benefit areas and and specific user groups. And in discussing this, you know, we the 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 our group basically came to the conclusion that if if you want to do that rigorously, there there has to be something like a structured decision making process that clearly lays out here is the relative contribution of observations of this particular variable to a specific 
societal benefit or, or a particular mission or a particular uh, information need in, in a decision making or planning context. And um, it might be worthwhile to hear from others on, in this group, you know, is, is that something that they could see going forward? Um, but it's certainly also something to consider for the for the expert panels, because it, it may be under, you know, assuming that the expert panels have representation from indigenous peoples, Arctic communities, other other information users, that would be a group under which a, you know, such a, a more structured approach to uh, identifying which which linkages are, you know, how impactful with respect to specific societal benefits uh, would, would fit. Thanks. I think that's a, a great um, a great point and a great potential place to to jump into further discussion here. Does anyone have any more comments related to that? I'll pick on you slightly, Sandy. Do you think uh, what do you have a sense of what that could look like um, with the roads process going forward? Specifically with developing more structured linkages between the societal benefits and the essential variables? Uh, yes, I think both the, the structured linkages part and then kind of how and who uh, identifies those. Yeah, um, I, I think the I think that how and who, uh, I think it's right to, to look to the expert panels. Um, I mean, when you, so my, my experience with, with similar processes is developing value tree analyses um, where you draw together the relevant group of subject matter experts and that, you know, is, is sort of what we're talking about for the expert panels. They're definitely the folks who are in the best position to, um, to do that evaluation. Um, the, and in that structured process that, that we've adopted nationally, um, the, you, you look at the, um, you, you weight the linkages based on how well something is doing, something might be connected, but that connection might be really link, uh, weak or tenuous or not that valuable. Um, and, and so it's in, in walking through a real structured end-to-end -end, uh, linkage where you, where you weight the, the linkages based on their value that you can really get the most rigorous assessment. Um, and I do think it would be an appropriate undertaking for expert panels um, you know, and, and, and really expert panels coming forward in the roads process, we, we didn't necessarily anticipate that they'd already say, hey, here's this expert variable or the, this essential variable I want to work on. It might be that they come forward with sort of a broader focus and want to work their way, use an assessment like that to to validate where they should be working and where they should be focusing um, so i think and i think that is part of the difficulty of you know in this context saying what do you think the variables should be we all have such diverse expertise here um, there's not kind of a critical mass of people to to focus on that um, but i think we are learning a lot about what what kinds of consideration what what should be taken into consideration who should be included and and how we're going to have to establish the validity of of what we've chosen to to work on thanks um so the other area that i thought we might want to 
dig into a little bit further. Unless, does anyone have any additional comments on, on expert panels or how those might be implemented before I move along? And you're also welcome to add any comments into the chat box if you'd like. Um, so the, the next the next place that I thought there might be um, some some room for discussion and fleshing out is this idea that we talked a lot about in in group two, but has has gotten some traction in some of the other discussions that's happened over the last two days uh, is is that observations should be in some way kind of clustered or bundled so that um, we are both leveraging the number and diversity of different groups and sectors working in the Arctic and um, kind of reflecting the idea that uh, nothing stands alone. Uh, everything really depends on the context. Um, especially for those of you that were in groups one or three, um, do you have any thoughts on kind of how we might think about bundling or grouping variables? All right, uh, we seem to have struck out on that one. Um, how about let's go back to the process then. Um, so part of the idea for this session was to, to kind of set up this, this draft process, see what worked, what didn't. Um, so as you were going through this discussion, uh, what parts felt valuable, what parts felt like you were making progress and, and what didn't work? Um, if, if nobody else is chiming in, um, oh, sorry, I see Bill has his hand up. Bill? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so, um, you know, there was the table at the end that could have been interpreted as being like a very precise workflow with um, well-defined elements to fill in. Mm -hmm. and, and that's an important, great, process for a broad group to go through, no doubt. Um, but I think it, it was also helpful to have um, broader discussion, free ranging discussion. So I think it's for perhaps not for expert panels, but for uh, the community, broadly speaking, to go through this process of vetting and brainstorming as well as uh, being very precise with uh, identifying EAVs and, and SBAs. Thanks. Kyle? Can I share my screen real quick as well? Um, yeah. Um, all yours. Thanks. Uh, because I, I did want to, I mean, uh, the working group, I, I was helping moderate. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm showing you now the parts of the notes here. And it's easier to explain while looking at this. I, I thought this group really was extremely insightful in terms of, you know, these three initial questions that relate to, okay, what, you know, what, 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 what does it take to be an essential Arctic variable? If you look at the different categories identified here, I mean, they nicely sort of outline the whole scope of, of where this is relevant, right? Including ecosystem functioning, sort of the classic state variables, the forecasting or prediction potential, community consultation. You know, Catherine had, uh, uh, be because of their work in the Beaufort Sea, had some great insights into that. But, but ultimately, you know, the, the, the challenge is, so how do, you, how do you evaluate the impact of a particular variable? All of that hinges on um, item number C, right? And that is, to whom is this? variable of actual value. It's, it's that group that's going to have to somehow determine that. And in the research community, you know, so Janet had quite a few comments on that in terms of, 
um, you know, prediction, well, you, you can use it to analyze, initialize your model, you know, you can use, you can use observations in the simulation frameworks, you can, you can use it to improve your understanding and representation of different physical, biological, you know, geochemical, socio-environmental processes. And th those, are, those are fairly well established, right? So we, we don't question those a lot. But all the other ones here, even specific aspects of ecosystem services or more broadly, you know, relevance that matters to different communities, that, that's the big challenge. You know, how do we, how do we evaluate these in concert um, and not just in isolation and do that in a way that these different, you know, sort of the different categories that you see show up here actually can can be, you know, at least somewhat semi-quantitatively uh, or at least qualitatively put into into some kind of ranking or order. You know, that's where uh, sort of getting back to to this conversation where the group felt that the expert panel and, and some type of structured decision making framework is important, but the, the other thing that, that I, I think our group sort of brought to the fore is that once you get to this level of detail here, it, it's really, it, it, for, for most of the variables, it's going to be at a very local scale, right? So Bill brought up the whole problem of coastal erosion related to permafrost thaw, and, and that isn't something that you just tackle at the Panarctic scale um, because it really varies quite a bit. And so... Somehow, you know, I, I, I like Bill's idea of saying, hey, you know, let, let's put together a hackathon or a more substantive workshop. But my conclusion and, and members of, of the working breakout group here can chime in is that if you do that, it really only makes sense if you pick a particular region within, you which, within which you you work through all of this. You know, because if you don't, then you'll still end up with I don't want to say platitudes, but but you end up with laundry lists of variables, you know, which which was something that our group was struggling with as well, because you 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 know you you suddenly recognize all these other connections, and they're difficult to eliminate if you do not have information users at the table who will tell you no, you know, this we we don't this is completely irrelevant to what mm -hmm. we care about right now. That, so that's, that's that's just a brief reflection. And I wasn't necessarily recommending a, a three day hackathon, but <laughs> um, I I guess I have trust in an expert panel and uh, and trust that there are enough mechanisms for community vetting as well as generalized brainstorming and, and other documents and recommendations and white papers and more to draw from. Um, I'd like to get into, uh, you guys talked about forecasting potential as being one of the kind of key indicators that a variable is at the essential or it rises to the level of essential. Could you guys expand on that a little bit? That was Janet. So I, I, I would call on Janet to, to bring that up. Can you repeat the question? I was I was multitasking. Sorry about uh, that. The, so, so um, you guys mentioned forecasting potential as a criteria um, for something being an essential Arctic variable, uh, or or the idea that forecasting potential is a is somehow an indicator that it's that important. Um, could you expand on that? Yeah, I I think one thought is that a forecast provides somebody with guidance that they then blend into their decision making process and it's not the job of the forecaster or that particular product to anticipate or even match with that part how that person blends in that information so um we just kind of put that out there that if you can make your forecast of whatever it might be and in from my point of view, it's more weather oriented. But if you can make that be as best as it can be, and you work with stakeholders to understand the different types of things they might need, then the value in it is in how they use it to guide their decisions. 
And I think that's what we were, the point of view we were coming from. Has oh, in go particular ahead, go ahead. a criterion, one criterion for evaluating the impact of an EOV? Did I get that right? Can you say that again? Uh, that's one important criterion for evaluating the impact of an EAV. Yeah. Yep. So, so that criteria also came up in this morning's discussions. Um, and one of the, one of the things that was part of that is that uh, variables or, or kind of concepts where we have enough understanding of the system to be able to make some sort of forecast are also variables that we, we know and have enough experience with and understand how they work at a higher level. Um, and so part, part of the forecasting potential is that we also have this kind of heightened understanding of the variable and its role in the system. So I'm, I'm glad to see that, uh, that, indicate, or that, um, that concept has come up twice now. And I, I think the, um, the example of uh, referring to meteorological parameters or weather parameters and benefits in the process is particularly easy for all of us to grasp because those are already pretty well defined universally within our minds of what is a weather parameter, for example. Um, so not that that necessarily needs to be an identified SBA, but uh, as an analog, if you will, uh, for comparison. Great, Sandy. I wanted to share something Larry Hinsman brought up um, in our breakout discussion from the joint working group meeting earlier today. And, and that was um, related to process understanding and the ability to scale observations up. And so, you know, I think he's probably to a large degree speaking from his terrestrial ecology and hydrology background, but sometimes what is um, constraining the broader use of a set of in situ observations is that we don't understand enough about the process to know how to scale it up and make it more broadly useful. And and I think that in the process, like when communities of practice or expert panels are gathering together to look at how to enhance the societal benefit of a given set of observations that might already exist, for example, I think inevitably we're going to learn that there's some other types of activities that we need to undertake, um, like in the case of forecasting and sea ice forecasting, we began to recognize that we needed to be focusing more on data assimilation schemes that hadn't been put in place yet um, that would be needed to take in some of the new variables, um, or, or in Larry's case, this, this idea of process understanding and scale um, needs to be taken into consideration. So I think that, again, speaks to some of the, the range of expertise that we'll need to um, include in these panels to make sure that we're not um, uh, leaving some value on the table that, that's a solvable problem. Um, can I just quickly jump in and comment feedback actually not even on the roads themselves but on the exercise that we had today um, yeah I just wanted to say that I think um, both sessions morning and this one were super successful in terms of uh, producing a lot of ideas working on the shared document in a very limited time and it helps a lot to yeah to sort of narrow down the concepts and just thinking about moving forwards with our lives after a AOS maybe yeah, having exercises like that more often, maybe even in the run-ups to expert panel meetings or something like that would be hugely 
useful. And yeah, I apologize if my report back wasn't very straightforward, but this is just because we produced so many different ideas in the relatively short time. And I think, yeah, it has a great potential. So it, it seems like a, a theme might be that these expert panel, like there's, there's a lot of things that we kind of think expert panels should address, but at the same time, we need to have a lot of community input. So it may be a layering process or an iterative process with a community input phase, expert panel, community response phase, expert panel again. Uh, Bill, go for it. I have a somewhat separate point that I wanted to bring up, but if now's a good time. Uh, go for it. Okay. So I think maybe it's become clear during this process that sometimes the definition of the term essential RT variable is, is maybe not, we're not all on the same page about what that definition is, right? What, what is that term? And then, um, and then I think later on when, when it comes down to identifying specific EAVs, um, in part we're grappling with issues of semantics. And by that I mean generally speaking on, in terms of language semantics, but also specifically in terms of uh, the uh, data community and the data world, how they approach the, uh, semantics, control vocabularies, ontologies, blah, blah, blah. So um, I think when it comes down to perhaps not the community, but the expert panels to work on this further, it would be really helpful, really helpful for them to draw from the semantics working group or in particular to be aware of the suite and ENVO ontologies and probably the suite ontology in particular in that it provides, you know, clarity not only on definitions but also relationships uh, hierarchically, hierarchically uh, among terms for uh, scientific observation. Do you have uh, kind of resources or, or places that we could point us for more information on those things? So it's one of those things where you, you can go to the GitHub for the semantics, sorry, for the suite ontology. And just the word ontology like scares people, right? And uh, it's involved. <laughs> and I am not the one to ask about these things. I mean, it's, um, I think it's something where the semantics working group under Sam may not be entirely overjoyed to have another task, if you will, but I, I think they have a, um, a range of knowledge and expertise here, expertise here that could, could help this process greatly. And, um, you know, in particular, I'm thinking about Ruth Dewar, um, but I don't, I didn't say that. I, did, I don't want to nail her specifically, <laughs> but, um, you know, Oystein Godoy as well. Um, and others, Pierre Luigi, Pierre Luigi. Um, uh, but I think it would uh, perhaps help clarify or streamline the process if we're aware of um, uh, the role of semantics, specifically controlled vocabularies, controlled vocabularies and ontologies uh, in this process moving forward. That seems like a great opportunity for the data community to do some kind of community education activities and in terms of teaching the rest of us who are not in, in those ontology conversations, uh, how to, I guess, how to talk. Um, so we have, uh, we've got about five minutes left on this session. Does anybody have any other thoughts of, related to really any of this stuff that they would like to share? All right, um, so uh, I'm going to, uh, sorry, my Zoom window has mostly disappeared. All I've got left is the chat. Um, there we go. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again um, with the uh, program uh, for the rest of working group one. Um, so at this point, we've made it through uh, days one and 
almost all of two. Um, the last two sessions that we have, uh, one tonight and then one tomorrow, um, are really going to be focusing on co consolidating and rounding out the recommendations that have come out of these sessions. Um, so I encourage you to, to join us for these. Um, the hope is to uh, to really expand on some of the things that we've been discussing, uh, have allow ideas to to float and to grow, um, and then to consolidate around recommendations um, to go into the AOS statement, uh, the uh, statement to the Arctic Science Ministerial, um, and then also kind of firming up um, at recommendations to send back to say on for the roads process. Um, so I hope you will join for those. Uh, I think that's where where we can turn many of the the great ideas that were discussed into into actionable steps moving forward. Um, uh, do any of the other working group one uh, chairs or members want to add anything to this? No, I I, I think that's a good um, good summary, Alice. I, I really would encourage people, we, we do have quite a bit of time, you know, I, I don't know whether all of that time is needed, but um, trying to hammer out at least two, three key points that you feel like this broader group need to be raised as part of the uh, AOS conference statement call to action, that's, that's going to be important because um, those, are, those are the things that are going to end up um, being transmitted over into the Arctic Science Ministerial. You know, tomorrow we'll have a session with the Icelandic Minister for Science and Education, Bill Alfred, Doctor. And so we'll, I, I, I think we, you know, we, we sort of have open ears, but we just want to make sure that we, we give, give those folks something to work with, you know, which, which specifically means what, what is it that we know we can do, but that requires particular action, some type of support, or a more concerted effort across different countries to move forward. That's, that's what, what I think is going to be important to hash out in, in the next two meetings, along with the broader summary of, of uh, working, of, of what, what this working group is working on. Thanks. Thanks, Haya. Um, so uh, with that, I think we are wrapping up our time today. Uh, I hope you'll uh, join us for the upcoming sessions, uh, the, the more plenary discussions happening over the next few hours. Um, and I look forward to talking to all of you again soon. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Alice. Hey, Alice, can you stay for, for a couple of minutes uh, just uh, yes. for, for yeah. a quick update? Great, yeah. thanks. Let's just wait till till folks sign off because I, mm -hmm. you know, we've got our um, kind of charge the working group session here in 15 minutes. I don't think that's going to take too long, frankly. It was more we put it on the agenda so that people have a chance to provide feedback or, or um, yeah. you know, other other raise questions before we get into the final details. But what, what's your sense um, in terms of working group one? Do you have you? I mean, I've reviewed some of the notes now, but I, I need to take more time on that. But have you seen uh, any sort of key one or two items, or even three that sort of crystallize out of out of these different meetings? Yeah. Um, so I th I think at this point I've been on all of the working group one calls. Um, and, and so I think the things that have, the things that have come out, um, I just sent you an email that I've been uh, plugging things into over the course of the last several hours. Um, I think that there's a lot, uh, there's a kind of wide sense from people who are reasonably plugged into communities um, uh, like Goose and, and especially atmospheric observing um, that the existing networks do a lot of things very well um, and that we should kind of avoid replicating those um, but that the value in an Arctic system, Arctic specific system is really in the cross-sector 
information um, and those linkages. Um, and so that's where the term shared Arctic variables came out this morning as uh, what we're really emphasizing are not necessarily the things that we're calling the you know the most important things in the Arctic, but that uh, where where this process and where this system can have the most impact is in facilitating this cross dis, uh, cross sector sharing. Um, yeah. And and then I think the other thing that's really been come out a lot is that we're going to need this process of going between community input and expert panels and then community revision um, for for moving forward with the roads process. Mm. Okay, great. No, that's that's good to hear. Maybe you can you can briefly bring that up in our in our next session as well. You know, because yeah. I, I think I like the the shared essential variables. That's that's a good you know a good perspective. Yeah. Um, I happy to do uh, it. One one. Uh, one other uh, more sort of technical question. So I looked in, in our folder, there's only three sets of notes from the cross cutting section in there. And I've been trying to figure out who, do you have the other two? Did you get uh, anything sent by email? I, I do have a couple sent by email um, that I, uh, I just haven't had time to move in yet. Yeah, so don't I worry think, about it. I, I just want to make sure we've got them all. Huh? Yeah, I I can spend a few minutes now um, making sure that they're all in there. All right, sounds yeah. good. So I'll I'll, um, I'll leave you to it. But that was a great session, actually. I'm I'm really uh, that was really well done. Um, yeah, I, I'm I think... I'm very happy with how this breakout worked. I think I think the combination mm -hmm. of the broader questions and then the more focused template it worked out really well. Yeah, and it, it really did, you know, it, it sort of, I, I think all of us in our group had a great learning experience because, you know, everybody started really narrow, you know, and yeah. then suddenly you could see how boom, you know, once you talk about, okay, what observations are needed, and they, they, it was all over the place. I mean, I, it, yeah. it was almost funny, and, and fortunately, everybody saw the humor in that, you know, because we were, people were talking about, you know, this is, this is in terms of permafrost saw, and they were talking about tracking pollutants automatically in the undersea environment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, so, it's, anyway, so. Yeah, I think I think every group that's tackled this this worksheet has had a different progression of like, oh, this is an easy problem. Oh, this is not an easy problem. Um, yeah. And then and then made some semblance of progress on it. Um, but it'll be interesting to line them all up next to each other and see what got written down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, good. Hey, I'll leave yep. you to it. I'm, I'm going to sign off and then we'll, we'll okay. Take care. Yeah. All right, talk to you later. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I have copied the chat box. So I to do that. Oh, fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. See you later.